Good afternoon, thank you, uh, and welcome to this event on aggression. Um, my name is Alex Whiting. Um, I'm a, pro a professor here, I know many of you, um, and I'll be moderating. Um, I want to uh, uh, make a couple of announcements, take a couple minutes to kind of contextualize this event, and then we'll start up. I'll introduce the panelists, of course, and I'll start in with some questions, kind of Oprah-style walking around the room. Um, and then at the end, I'll, I will open it up for questions, um, so uh, be thinking of what you might ask. Um, so first of all, thanks to the Dean's Office for sponsoring this event. Um, uh, apologies that there's no food, but you all know that there's a strike going on, and that's the reason. Um, also, you may have noticed that the event is being recorded, um, and so you've now been put on notice that you're being recorded, it'll be posted, um, so if you speak, during the event, you have consented to the recording and to have being recorded. Um, so this event uh, looks both backwards and forwards. Um, it's, it's This month is the 70, 70th anniversary of the judgment at Nuremberg. And um, when we think about Nuremberg today, uh, we often think about the crimes of the Holocaust and cri crimes committed against millions of Jews and others, um, civilians, uh, you know, murders and torture, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes. But actually the principal crime at Nuremberg was, um, please come in and, and take a seat, make yourselves comfortable, there are plenty of, plenty of seats. Um, the principal crime at Nuremberg was the crime of aggression. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the judgment that was handed down on October 1st, uh, 70 years ago, said that, um, called the, the, the crime of aggression the supreme international crime. So it was the leading crime for the court and for Justice Jackson who represented the United States. Um, the, but the crime of aggression is the one crime that has not survived into the modern international tribunals that started being created in the early 1990s, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, Rwanda Tribunal, all the, the other crimes, genocide crimes against humanity, war crimes, have all been prosecuted, but not the crime of aggression. It has not been prosecuted by any modern international court. That may change next year, uh, because the International Criminal Court has um, included the crime of aggression in its statute, um, albeit without a, a, a definition, so it was not legally effective. Um, but it is in the process of making it legally effective. So in 2010, the International Criminal Court held a review conference um, and in intense negotiations where our two guests played very important roles, and it's for the reason that's why they're here to talk about it. Um, the, the, the Assembly of States parties um, reached a, came to a consensus on a definition of the crime of aggression, and we'll talk about that definition and the jurisdictional elements, and a process for ratification of that crime. And it was a seven-year process uh, where states, that, there, there would have to be 30 states, at least 30 states that ratify, 30 of the 124 states that are members of the court, and then in 2017 there would be a final vote uh, of the Assembly of States parties that would, either, and it, uh, at least two thirds of the ASP is required to finally vote and implement it. We have more than 30 ratifications now, so that has been fulfilled. So the last thing, the last step that has to be taken now is the vote in 2017, and that would make the crime effective, and for the first time since Nuremberg, there would be an international court that could prosecute the crime of aggression. So uh, it's important now to think about what happened at Nuremberg and what might happen in the future. What does this crime mean? Why are we going to include it in the court? What are the problems that might arise, um, both with the definition of the crime and the scope of the jurisdiction? So we've brought today to talk about this um, two uh, distinguished uh, guests. Um, first, I'll introduce uh, Ambassador Christian Benaveser. Um, he is the permanent representative to the United Nations um, from the country of Liechtenstein, a position he has held since 2002. Um, more pertinent to our discussion here, from 2008 until 2011, he was the president of the Assembly of States Parties of the International Criminal Court, and that's why in 2010 he played such an important role 
in the negotiations about the definition of the crime of aggression. Um, and we have also Professor Harold Coe from the, Harold, from the Yale Law School, um, who, um, in addition to being my mentor in law school, uh, more significantly, he was um, the uh, legal advisor at the State Department from, uh, gotta get these dates, 2009 to 2014. So in 2010 at the Kampala Review Conference, he was the, uh, he led the US delegation um, to the review conference and was uh, critical in the negotiations. Oh, co-led with Steve Rapp. Oh, yeah, well, sorry, sorry. Also, with, sorry, sorry, co-leader with Steve Rapp, who um, was the, I, I'm gonna call it war crimes ambassador, even though I know it has a different title now. Global, ju ambassador for global justice? Criminal justice. Criminal justice, okay. Um, and uh, even though the United States is not a state party to the International Criminal Court, um, the U.S. played an important role in the, in the negotiations. So um, I want to start off my first question to Ambassador Venevisar. Um, why, can you tell us why, um, why is it important to include this crime in the statute now? What impact do you think it would have on the world if it's included in the court? Um, and is there an example from recent, you know, the recent modern times, recent times, last ten years, uh, of a of a of a use of military force that you think would fall under the definition of aggression in the statute. Thanks a lot, Alex. It's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to the to the dean for making this possible. Um, it's great to be with Harold again. We've done this before. It's been a while. Um, First thing to say maybe is, you know, it's, it's not a decision to include this now in the Rome Statute. That's a decision that was made in 1998. So when states got together to write the Rome Statute and to establish the International Criminal Court, there was agreement that this crime is one of the four most serious crimes under international law. So you have rightly pointed to the, to the Nuremberg legacy, uh, which of course is in particular with respect to, to this crime, but in, in fact with respect to, to the entire undertaking is very much a U.S. legacy because the U.S., of course, was the driving force be, uh, behind the Nuremberg trials. And the language, this is the supreme crime under international law, this is what Justice Jackson said at the time. So it's important to make that link back. It's also important to understand that the tribunals you have mentioned in between in a way naturally didn't have jurisdiction. Uh, over this crime, because the Rwanda tribunal was, you know, that was not an aggressive war. That was a genocide against part of the population. In the Yugoslavia war, of course, there was a, a big legal discussion, is this a civil war or is this an international uh, armed conflict? So again, it was quite natural to not have this included. States never stopped feeling that this was one of the most serious crimes under international law. And this is why we would not have had the treaty in 98 without including it in it. So that's, that's my first point, and I think it's a very important point. What we were not able to do in 98 is to find a definition. So the court was not uh, given jurisdiction, but it was clear from the beginning this is part of the Rome Statute. So this is completing the treaty. Once this is activated, once the court can exercise jurisdiction over this treaty, we have the treaty, finally, that we had set out uh, to put together in 98. The second point is, you know, I think it is very, very obvious how important this is. And you have seen many discussions about the legality of the use of force uh, in this country. In other countries, I think the most, uh, the most uh, prominent case recently was the, uh, the publication of the Chilcot Report in the United Kingdom, um, where you see that the criticism that was uh, put forward of the, of the, of the Blair government to, uh, to engage in a military action uh, against Iraq at the time. You're all familiar with that discussion. That is not you know, to say that I have a view one way or the other, but it's, it's a, a way of saying that this is very, very important. It plays an extremely important role in domestic discussions uh, and in international discussions. So the value, in a way, of 
having this in the Rome Statute more than anything else is that you now have for the first time in the history an internationally agreed definition of what the crime of aggression is, what an illegal war is. That, in my view, is what is important, not the cases that may or may not become before the ICC. We will talk about this. We will talk about the massive limitations, in a way, in the exercise of jurisdiction that we imposed on the court itself. So we know that the court, starting next year, will not start prosecuting people left, right, and center for this crime because there are very serious limitations on the exercise of jurisdiction. But that, in my view, is not the most important achievement. The most important achievement is that you now have, as a, as a policymaker, as a, as a legislator, as a lawmaker, as somebody who makes a decision in your country, you have the legal basis to decide whether what you're about to do is in accordance with international law or not. Um, and, you know, your, your last question, an example, you know, most, uh, most people, including um, the US government, European governments have, of course, uh, called the uh, annexation of the Crimea by the uh, Russian Federation uh, an act of aggression. I think that is to answer, to give you the most uh, say prominent or talked about or least controversial example from recent years. So, uh, okay, thank you, Professor Ko. I, I want to give you an opportunity to comment on on what the ambassador has said, but I also want to put a, a, a another question to you, which is um, the the tribunal at Nuremberg um, it, when it said it was the that uh, the crime of aggression was the supreme international crime also said that it was no different from the atrocity crimes. It just, that the atrocity crimes of war crimes and crimes against humanity, it just, in, it, it just encompassed all of those crimes. However, you've written um, that it is, it is different from those crimes in important ways that should affect both the jurisdictional triggering mechanism, who makes the decision about whether uh, an act of an aggression or a crime of aggression has occurred, and perhaps also the definitional scope of the crime itself. Could you comment about that? Uh, so let me say something about Nuremberg, about the ICC and Christian's uh, role in developing it, and then uh, the, the issue that you raise. Uh, so first of all, it's important to remember that you know, Nuremberg wasn't a, a done deal. Um, you know, Stalin recommended that all the Nazis be shot. Uh, so did Churchill actually said that the senior leader should be shot. Um, Henry Morgenthau, our own Treasury Secretary, said they should all be taken out and summarily executed. So the fact that Nuremberg ended up in a trial, which Justice Jackson called <coughs> the greatest tribute that power can pay to reason to stay the hand of vengeance, is a very significant statement for law. Second, uh, after Nuremberg, there was a long time before we got back to international criminal justice, uh, it took a lot of different steps, the Yugoslav tribunals, the Rwanda tribunal, but the Rome statute uh, in 1998 was a huge accomplishment. But working out uh, the operation of a, a working international criminal court, standing court with uh, broader jurisdiction was a huge challenge. And uh, Christian is very modest, but uh, he was, uh, one of the people who did the most, I think, to as president of the Assembly of States parties to get things up and running, uh, particularly his role at the Kampala conference in 2010, which was a great challenge. So he deserves credit for this. He remains one of the most influential voices on these issues, and I hope he stays involved uh, because, frankly, uh, he can give leadership that few others can give. Now, during this period, uh, Steve Rapp and I for the Obama administration tried to sort out the U.S. relationship to the ICC and to get away from overt hostility and toward a situation of coexistence and cooperation. And that was achieved over years, and you don't hear the kinds of uh, hostile comments by the United States that were made during the last administration. But this brings me to my uh, third point, uh, Kampala has a problem, uh, and we need to fix it. Uh, 
So let me state the problem this way. Um, how many of you think that more force would be required by the next president in Aleppo? Don't be shy. Or are you comfortable with the slaughter continuing? Well, it's a good question. You know, Hillary Clinton has said that we need no-fly zones or humanitarian zones. So has Tim Kaine. So has Mike Pence, you may have noticed. Now, Donald Trump disagreed before he went on to other kinds of statements. <laughs> but imagine this. Uh, it's February of 2017. Uh, you're in the Oval Office with the new president, who, let's say it's a woman. And she says, I want to now carry forward my promise to organize a multilateral effort to uh, put either a no-fly zone or a humanitarian zone in place inside of Syria. Then what is the chance that it will be approved by the UN Security Council? Zero. There are five vetoes by Russia, and it's not going to stop. So what if we do it multilaterally, as we did in Kosovo, with all of the NATO countries cooperating? After all, she would say, the UK, the Belgians, and the Danes have all issued legal opinions in which they say some kind of humanitarian intervention can be lawful even without a Security Council resolution. She could say, do US generals and politicians face a risk of prosecution at the ICC? Answer, no. Why? The US is not a party. Oh, yeah? OK, what about the Brits? They are a party. What about the French? They are a party. What about the Danes? They are a party. What about the Belgians? They are a party. What about the other NATO nations? If they provide lift, if they provide helicopters, if they provide participation in the no-fly zone, can you guarantee that their constitutional leaders will not be prosecuted uh, by uh, the uh, independent prosecutor of the ICC? The answer is no, you can't. Why? Because the Russians will say this is a manifest violation of the charter. What could be more obvious? Article 2.4 says you should respect territorial integrity. And that's what you're proposing to do, to cross into Syrian zones. The Syrians and the Russians will criticize this deeply. And this is a great irony, of course, because as Christian has pointed out, the most blatant act of aggression that's recently occurred is Putin's aggression in Ukraine. They're not going to prosecute him for that. But the question ought to be, and I'm sure you will be asked this by the next president, do you mean to say to me, that atrocity prevention by using force to prevent genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity could conceivably be prosecuted as a crime of aggression by states who have not opted out of the crime of aggression? And the answer is, that's where the law currently stands. If the crime is activated and more than 30 countries have ratified, then it's to the discretion of the prosecutor as to what kind of case they're going to bring. That is a problem. That's a problem. It's a human rights problem, because it means that instead of simply having uh, ex ante atrocities prevention, you are left to ex post accountability for these violations. And it means that it is impossible to put a group of countries together who will intervene to prevent gross slaughter for going on, which is done in Syria for more than five years. Now, the real question is, OK, it's a problem. Is it an insoluble problem? No, it's not an insoluble problem. So what does it take? First, you have to admit there is a problem. And uh, my good friend Christian, frankly, has, to my mind, still not fully appreciated the magnitude of this issue. Um, but I hope that this, this, uh, this uh, discussion will um, actually have an impact in that regard. Now, 
Going to your question, Alex, the differences are that the crime of aggression runs against state leaders and it runs against states. And so uh, those who make operative decisions have to decide what's going to happen. Now, they have an option. They could opt out of the crime of aggression altogether. Most countries that are states' parties don't want to do that because they believe uh, in the core mission. Can they interpret uh, the uh, ratification of the amendment to exclude what they consider to be lawful humanitarian intervention? Well, then you have to decide what is lawful humanitarian intervention, and there is no such uh, agreement. In Kampala, there was an effort to create an understanding on this. It was rejected. So at the end of the day, and I say this as someone who's given this kind of advice to people who care very much about human rights, but also about atrocities prevention, you cannot say with certainty to a NATO member and the prime minister of that country, who is a state party, who has uh, not ratified the crime of aggression, whether they will or will not be prosecuted in a case in which another country would be claiming a manifest violation of the charter. If you can't give that kind of assurance, we have an issue that law needs to fix, and uh, there's still time to fix it. But there's a story, how many, uh, how many people does it take to change a light bulb? How many shrinks does it take to change a light bulb? The light bulb has got to want to change, right? Well, at this point, the ICC has to recognize there's a problem. And if they don't, um, there's going to be a major, major issue before this crime gets activated. And if it's done wrong, the crime of aggression will have hurt the cause of human rights and will have hurt the cause of atrocities prevention. Uh, in the guise of completing something uh, that was started many, many years ago. Ambassador, is there a problem? Um, <clears throat> uh, no, there is no problem. <laughs> you know, one point that I think is very important here to understand is that things have changed and that people do believe that legality is important. Um, and this has, you know, you've seen this in domestic discussions. You've seen it in domestic discussions in the United States. You watch the presidential debates. You know, every single time, doesn't matter, you know, who, who it is. It's you voted, it, you voted in favor of the intervention in Iraq and, you know, and people saying, no, I didn't, or some of them saying, no, I didn't. Um, I didn't vote anyway express themselves. So that is a big issue. It's a big issue in the UK. It's a big issue in every single country that has had this type of experience. Uh, almost half of the states that have accepted the Kampala regime over the crime of aggression are NATO member states. They know what they are doing. They have examined this text. They have come to the conclusion that they agree with that as they agreed with it in Kampala. It was a consensual outcome. So the discussion we're having here is actually not about the definition, because the definition is something that you agreed with in Kampala. The definition is something that we did together. So the discussion here is, can you be sure that and who is subject to, to, to jurisdiction? And you know, I've mentioned that in, in my first comments, and you mentioned it now, Harold. This regime is extremely limited to you know, for the time being, a very small number of states. Everybody who is not a part of the Rome Statute, as the United States is not, as almost as 89 other states are not, the court has, does not have jurisdiction over. If you are a state party and you feel that, you know, you share some of the concerns that Harold has voiced, and you feel, well, I'm not... 100% comfortable, and maybe I may want to engage in a use of force that is perhaps questionable under this definition, then you can just say so. You can simply say the regime does not apply to me, and everybody will say, okay, fine. So you make a declaration, you send this to the ICC, you don't have to explain why, you just say the jurisdiction over the crime of aggression does not apply to me, period, end of story. 
One country has done that, the country is Kenya. Others may do it, it's not something we encourage. It's not something we discourage either. We think you know, it's part of the treaty, it's your sovereign right to do that. So if states are uncomfortable with the regime, they do not have to subject themselves to it. So it, is, it really is as simple as that. Now as far as you know, the humanitarian intervention argument that you have made, if you look at, and you have, you know, you've mentioned Syria, um, and if you look at this incredible tragedy that has evolved over the past five and a half years, uh, if you look at this complete breakdown of multilateral diplomacy, the complete failure to address the situation that has you know, evolved into, has a, a very strong regional dimension now, has caused a massive refugee uh, displacement problem, no end inside. If you look at that, you know, the reason why people have not acted differently are policy reasons, are not legal reasons. Um, you also know that, of course, a number of states are militarily active in Syria today to, you know, what effect and with what result uh, we are seeing on a, on a daily basis. But the point here is that we discuss this very extensively in Kampala, that we have a very high threshold for an illegal use of force to be a crime of aggression. Not every form of the illegal use of force amounts to an act of aggression, amounts to a crime of aggression, and is therefore su subject to the, to the jurisdiction of the court. To meet the threshold of a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations is an extremely high threshold, and states are comfortable with that. So now you see the problem. Christian doesn't admit there's a problem. So let me, let me ask you directly. I mean, um, suppose I said, OK, Christian, I can get you 10 minutes with the president-elect. She asks you the exact same question. She says, I just heard you up at Harvard saying the Chilcot report is an example of why we need a crime of aggression. Are you saying that the Brits can be prosecuted for Iraq? What is the assurance that we have when we talk to the Brits, the French, the Danes, and the Belgians about joining the NATO force that it's not going to be called a manifest violation of the charter and hence prosecutable? Where is the assurance? No, I think the answer to that is what the Chilcot report is an indication of is... Where is the assurance? Is that you will have a different discussion in the United Kingdom next time around. The people understand that this is a problem and they want to base... They want to base their decisions firmly on a legal basis. Right. This so is what we're giving them. That's the exact point. The conversation they're going to have is, uh, will we now support humanitarian action in, in Syria, having argued since Kosovo that it's legal to do it under these circumstances, or we are now chilled by the prosecution of being prosecuted for the crime of aggression? And by the way, what will more likely happen is they'll stop having inquiries like the Chilcot report, and they'll stop doing these things precisely so as not to expose their internal problems with international law to the world. I mean, you don't have an answer on this, and you're not giving me one. And, well, yeah, I'm um, giving you the answer. No, the answer is that some of your very good friends are very comfortable and have indicated that by ratifying and that some and of by them not are, out. And a lot of them are not. Correct. The Australians haven't. The Canadians haven't. The, uh, the Brits haven't, the French haven't. Who, so, uh, you know, it's, it's fine to have countries uh, that never use force to ratify, but if you want this to be the completion of the Nuremberg exercise with 124 states' parties being seriously interested in this, you have to have a better answer to this question than you're giving these people other than that some people like it. Now, by the way, I am saying this is a soluble problem. So if you will admit there's a problem, then there are two more steps. One, agree upon some kind of interpretive statement of the kind that the Germans made when they ratified that everybody could make, and have this be part of the global understanding of what this is about, which is if you're making a good faith, serious effort at humanitarian intervention that meets certain objectively verifiable standards, that's not a manifest violation and does not fall within the definition. Now, this is a loose end that's left over from Kampala. You couldn't solve every problem in Kampala, but that's why we waited seven years. So we can solve it now. Now, what you're going to say is, you know, we worked so hard at Kampala. I agree. But guess what? We didn't solve every problem. And this is one that 
is big, it's soluble, but you have to face up to it collectively and soon, and soon. And the answer that you're giving, which is there are some countries that are comfortable with it, is just not a good enough answer. Yes, it is a good enough answer. And the, the, good, the reason why it's a good enough answer is because you know Good enough for Liechtenstein, but not good enough no, for me, the countries of the world. No, 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 I'm serious. No, no, let me speak. I'm serious. You really no, have to give it's, it's, it's not true. It's not true what, it, what he's saying, Harold. Um, you, of course, know how many hours you and I have spent together in Kampala. To do this, you know that this resulted in a consensus in Kampala. Of course, you were not uh, in a position to ask for a vote because you're not a party to the Rome Statute. It's not your treaty, but you were there, and nobody, was, nobody had a stronger presence than you were, and nobody was included more than you were in those discussions. I'm not saying some people are comfortable with it and others are not. What I'm saying is this agreement was reached by consensus of everybody who was a party to the treaty at the time. Whether you ratify it afterwards or not is your sovereign decision to make. We have 32 states that have made that decision for themselves, including some of your very good friends. You have the opportunity, not you because you don't need that. Everybody else who is a state party has the opportunity to now say, not only do I not, do not want to ratify, I do not want that legal regi regime to apply to me for the time being. For whatever reasons, you don't even have to explain them. You can say, well, you know, I want to see how this plays out. I want to see how the court interprets, you know, certain interventions if they come. We want to see how the court applies that law. Maybe later, you know, we withdraw our, uh, our opt-out. You have all the opportunities in the world, but the law that we have created is very solid, and it was created with your help. So, l l can I, can I, Christian, can I no, Christian's a very skilled um, diplomat, and I, I admire him greatly. But everybody knows that in these immense conferences, when you get to the end, and there's a document, and you say, is there a consensus? Then, in fact, there may be different interpretations of some of the things, but those who are trying to get to yes, say, okay, we agree on this, and let's figure out how to work out our differences over time. That's what happened in Paris at the climate change meeting, and that's what happened in Kampala. Now, I've written an article in the American Journal of International Law, 106 American Journal of International Law, which points out that there is an issue, and it's exactly this one, on which there was, in fact, no consensus. So to simply say, well, we gaveled through a consensus meant that half of the people or some significant number thought it meant something, and some significant number thought it meant something else. Now, if you're saying that it's not a problem, then let's agree now on an interpretive declaration that clarifies this issue. Now, I want you to hear what Christian said about the Brits. He said what the British could do if they don't like it is opt out of the crime of aggression. So could the French, so could the Belgians, so could the Danes. Why is that in anybody's interest? Why not clarify that you can opt into the crime of aggression, but clarify that if you see the need to do humanitarian intervention, which you believe to be lawful, that that is not a manifest violation of the charter? So my point is this. The chairman has a difficult job, but if the chairman is accused of claiming consensus when on one of the most pressing issues of the day, it is very clear that there are two competing views, then we have a problem. And that problem will come home to roost the next time everybody is together discussing this issue, which is next year. I, okay, I'm going to no, let no, Christian... respond to that. You, of course. Yeah. But let me... I want to press uh, Harold on something here. On, uh, on the opt-out solution, because that's the, that is the one solution that uh, the ambassador has offered, that the that if there's concern, France, Britain, they can opt out. You said, why would it be in their interest? But is there, a, is there any reason why you wouldn't do it? Is there a cost to those countries, an, an argument for why they wouldn't do it, if they're concerned about this interpretation? That's my first thing I wanted to press. And then the second thing is, I, 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 I would imagine that part of the argument for not embarking on a, another round of discussion about uh, an, interpret an interpretation about humanitarian in intervention is that, at, it, and this is really the point, what I understood the point about the consensus to be, is that it's a it, it, once you've reached that consensus, if you open it up again, 
it will you will undo everything that it will it, you'll ne there'll, there'll be there'll be debates about all sorts of things and you'll undo what you've done and it'll, and you'll never get across the finish line so the second point is an easy one uh, at rome 72 different countries issued declarations so issuing declarations along with ratification is 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 done the question is should there be one so let me put you in the office of Theresa May at 10 Downing Street. And you're the legal advisor now of the British Foreign Office. And Theresa May says, um, well, 31 countries or 32 countries, one of whom is Kenya, have now ratified the crime of aggression. Uh, can, jurisdiction, can jurisdiction be execute, uh, exercised by the court over a British national <coughs> Um, even though we have not ratified the crime of aggression? And the answer is, uh, under the theory on which uh, Christian claims a consensus, yes. So then the question for you is, do you, in addition to Brexit, also want to opt out of the crime of aggression oh, yeah. when your national was one of the prosecutors at Nuremberg? To which point she ought to say, wisely, are those my only options? What if I, and then you ought to be able to say, well, a third option is to issue a declaration which says, we do not believe that valid humanitarian intervention under our legal standard or under a generally accepted legal standard is a manifest violation of the charter. And on that basis, we ratify the crime of aggression as well. And what Christian is saying is to have this simple fix adopted by many, many sympathetic countries is going to disrupt his consensus. In fact, what it will do, it will lead to many, many more countries ratifying the crime of aggression, which ought to be his ambition. So my question is, why do you persist in these two quite different interpretations when a fix is available and ought to be implemented in the next year by people who care about the crime and care about the future of the court? Okay, you'll have a problem with speaking time allocated. <laughs> We, we've heard that complaint before. <laughs> I know, I'm just saying. Uh, okay, so the way it works is you have a body that makes the law, you have a body that applies the law. Um, and, you know, I don't need to tell that anyone in here, because you all know that much better than I do. We made the law in Kampala. The court is to apply the law, and it will do so. Uh, now what he's saying, Harold, you know is not possible. You're saying it's an easy fix. We've had these discussions in Kampala. We came to the language that we came to address humanitarian intervention because everybody was sufficiently comfortable with it to accept it. Everybody. So we didn't, I didn't, I did, I, did not not, I did not gavel through a consensus among ignorant people in the room, and then they walked out and said, oh, that's what I agreed to. I did not do that. We had talked about this not only for the two weeks that we spent together in Kampala, we had talked about this actually for all those years before where the US government had, you know, before you, decided not to participate in the discussions. As soon as he came in, we included you, and, you know, we looked for you to be part of that discussion, and you were, and you, play, you made a very important contribution to that discussion. Now, political cost of opting out, you know, you will see that, you will see that in, a, in, a, in a state that does it. I do not know that. Of course, if you, if you have a, a government that says, look, I don't want to be covered by this regime, of course you may have uh, people in, in the parliament to say what's wrong with you, because this is a great law and we should be part of it. And then you have to be able to defend that towards your constituency. That's perfectly fine. To, to compare it to Brexit, I mean, really. Uh, this is really not of comparable uh, magnitude at all. You can say this is almost a separate treaty because we have set up a, se a separate regime. We have set up a very high threshold of states that need to ratify. 30 states, uh, 30 ratifications required is an extremely high threshold. So it is perfectly anyone's right to say, I'm not comfortable yet. I want to see what the court does with it. There's nothing wrong with that. This, this is why we put it in. And this is why we put it in, you know, to not put states that are part of the Rome Statute 
in a worse position, so to speak, than states that are not, such as yourselves, because you're not subject to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the jurisdiction anyway, and everybody knows that. So this is why we did that, and this is why that option is there. But I think the interesting thing is that you have all those states that are your friends, that are your NATO partners, that have looked at this, and they have done this very, very meticulously. So if you look at the discussion that, that took place, for example, in the Netherlands, where they had a big discussion on humanitarian intervention, people did raise that in Parliament, and in the end they said, no, this is fine. This is good enough for us, we are a good NATO member, but this law is good enough for us and we want to be part of it. And I think that is the important part of that discussion, to see how states respond to it. Okay. So let me ask you a simple yes or no And then question. I want to pivot to another yeah, question. This is a very simple yes or no question. Theresa May asks you, a distinguished ambassador, to this question. She says, okay, so Brexit and this are not comparable, but I understand I could be prosecuted for this, but not for Brexit. So maybe I think them, of, of them as uh, both issues. So here is my question, she says. If 31 countries have ratified the crime of aggression, but not the UK, and the UK is a state party, and we wait, can and we do not opt out, can a British national who's being prosecuted for a claim of aggression in a country that has ratified be prosecuted for the crime of aggression, yes mm. or no? You just said a very important thing. In a country that has ratified, yes. so in Syria, who falls under the jurisdiction of the ICC? Okay, so pick another Nobody. country. Pick Nobody. Another country. Not a single country. Is that your answer? That's your no. answer? But that's an important. That's the, that's the example you gave. That the example you gave is we cannot intervene in Syria anymore. The answer to that is there is no jurisdiction in Syria because Syria is not a party to the Rome Statute. End of story. Even with the, the issues that you claim to have, that is very clear. So then Theresa that May is not, says... That is not a state uh, party. Uh, uh, well, come, Theresa come on, May got to say we want to attack that's Belgium? Not, that's not your answer because the answer then is... Christian, Christ, the answer then is... Well, then let's get every country in which we might end up using force to not ratify the crime of aggression. Isn't that the answer? No, that's not the answer. Or not be a state answer. party? No. Why is this in your interest? You want no, this crime no, no, to be but adopted? That's, look. <laughs> but by the way, your answer was yes. Your answer my was yes. My answer was not yes. You heard my answer. Everybody heard my answer. It's an important it's answer. Nobody has jurisdiction in... No, the court has jurisdiction over nobody in, in Syria if that intervention... So over what that British he gave an example. When uh, do British nationals subject to the jurisdiction of We've this crime? We've been doing this for six years. When, so. when are no, no, British no, 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 nationals finish, subject to the jurisdiction of this crime? In 2010, this was adopted in Kampala. 2010. And, you, and you're saying, well, it's in the interest of the UK government and of other governments to go around and, and tell other people not to ratify it. They have not done that. Nobody has done that. We Everybody the question, has said... When no, will British, I'm, when I'm will British nationals argument. be subject to this crime? They will be subject to this crime if, A, they commit the crime. A, against, something that somebody says is a manifest violation of the Charter, right? against like the Russians. A state, against a state that is a party of the Rome Statute, okay. such as Belgium and, and or if Liechtenstein. The, and, if or the Brit, and if the Brits haven't opted out. To which the answer is then, okay, so they're exposed, and British nationals are exposed in 30 countries right now, unless you opt out. Isn't that the answer? The answer is that if you use force against another state, and you do that without the authorization from the Security Council, which is a requirement under the Charter of the United Nations, then you better look at the Kampala Amendments if you're a state party. I think you should do that even if you do that against a state that is not a party to the Rome Statute. I think it does not matter because you, the problem you have is a domestic problem. The problem that you have is that people say, we do not want to continue using force in a way that may be illegal. Okay, let me, let me oh, pivot. I, mean, I, I just think, Alex, this absolutely proves what I'm saying, because <laughs> you're saying to Theresa May, if you order the use of force without opting out in one of 30 countries, you could be prosecuted, even if you think it's meritorious. You could be prosecuted. It's in the hands of the prosecutor. Harold. Your point was you Isn't cannot, you can Isn't no longer get the UK to intervene with you militarily in Syria, even though you're not doing that anyway, 
um, and the, because of the ICC, and the answer to that is that is not true. Christian, I gave legal advice to leaders of states who have to make these decisions, and what you're saying is it was all resolved in Kampala, to which my response is, no, it wasn't. And what you're saying is, if you don't like it, opt out. No, but if you, if you, like, if you yes, do like it, no, you're no. exposed. But okay. if you like yes, no answer. So, so what is the answer to the question, if the UK is to intervene you know, in 2017 militarily in Syria without Security Council authorization, does the ICC have jurisdiction? Yes or no? Well, the question answer is, is no. <laughs> so the answer is no country should ever ratify the ICC no. and no country should ratify these amendments no, if the they don't want to be prosecuted. The That's answer the is you're obfuscating the topic. The problem no. is not what you're saying the problem is. You're saying that everybody should ratify and you're also saying there is no problem because people who don't like it should opt out. And what I'm saying is that doesn't solve the problem. What I offered instead is... How about the people who want to ratify do it with an interpretive declaration? And people, you say that somehow disrupts the consensus. People who ratify can declare whatever they want to declare. They cannot expect that to have the same standing in law as the law itself has. Of course, you know, you cannot come and say, oh, actually, I meant this to be this and not what it says. Uh, I mean, you can say that. And, you know, if you have 100 states that say that, of course, if I'm a judge, which I'm not, of course have a look at that and say, oh, that's actually important that, you know, 25 or 50 or 100 states have said, I think this is what the law means. I will take this into consideration in interpreting the law. But m my text is the law itself. This is what guides me. Okay. So, you, Harold, yeah, your solution just, is Just to last point. What would you just heard him say? Uh, no. I mean, come on. This is a law school. What you just heard him say is he doesn't think a declaration works to opt out, so you're going to have to opt out or nothing. My question a is, declaration why is to opt a out. Way? A declaration to opt out is part of the law. Of course that works. If you opt out, the court will never ask you, why did you do that? No, I understood it's just him, there. the interpretive understanding wouldn't necessarily be binding. Exactly. That's what I that's what Of course I it isn't. I mean, that I can, your proposal... I can, so he says it, opt out or nothing. If you don't want to be bound, opt out or nothing. Is, is that correct? That's, That's what, what I understand, that, is what states, that you have to opt out. That is what, uh, that that is what 120 states agreed to in Kampala. And that, that encourages opt-outs. My point is a significant... Then opt why have we seen only one? Why have we so, seen so few ratifications? We're at it's 30 ratifications. Few. We have 32. Well, you have 93 more to go, and the countries that you're going to want to join this are actually all debating this question right now. But and you, you the, say there's not a problem. That's not the point. The point is we have met the threshold we set ourselves in Kampala. It has been a very successful ratification process. You know, it's not about having cases before the ICC, and I tried to say that in my opening comments because it isn't. The jurisdiction is so narrow with possible opt-outs with, uh, you know, all these states not being party to the Rome Statute, that, that means not being, uh, you know, not being subject to the jurisdiction over this regime. We may not see cases for a very, very long time. That is not the point. The point is to have legal clarity in domestic discussions and the possibility of having, over time, you know, a, a potentially growing exercise of jurisdiction by the court. I'm in no you know, I'm in no rush. I don't need to see. I don't need to see a case. Um, if we see one, you know, if you look at what the possible, uh, what the what the options are right now, it's very unlikely that we will see one anytime soon. But that's not the important point for me. The important point for me is to say, we have completed the Rome Statute. We have set out to do something in Kampala. We have said we need to get the 30 ratifications. We have them, and now let's just activate it and let the court do its work. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to the audience for questions. Um, but I, but I, I was going to ask whether you think, and it, it sort of goes to the point, Ambassador, that you just made about you don't expect cases um, to actually happen, f perhaps for a long time, but the court will still have to consider cases. So there'll be cases will be brought to the court to be considered. Is the court, is the International Criminal Court suited now? Is it, is it capable of taking on these cases? Is it, it's had a kind of rocky first years um, with the cases it, it, ha it has under war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. Do, do, do you have confidence that it will be able to do it? But you can incorporate that question in, into the, your answers to the, the audience. Tony. 
Uh, and if, make your questions short. Do I have to introduce myself or not? Hi, this is Antonio Coco. I'm a visiting researcher from the University of Geneva. Uh, do you think states who are interested in humanitarian intervention may ask the ICC or the prosecutor to issue a statement or a declaration explaining the meaning of the law, whether an intervention which is strictly limited to protecting civilians would constitute a manifest violation of the charter by character, gravity, and scale? I'm going to take a couple of questions. So. Hi, Catherine Sicking from the Harvard Kennedy School. It seems to me that if we just step back from your debate a little bit, that part of the debate is about what do we know about what actually leads to atrocity prevention, okay? And, um, and so, uh, Professor Coe, is ma you're making an argument saying that, that you believe that unilateral humanitarian intervention is an essential tool for atrocity prevention. And it, it seems, you know, I'm a, I'm a political scientist, I do international relations, and what we know from empirical studies of core crimes is that the, fa the single factor that's most correlated with mass atrocity is war, especially civil war, but also international war. And so I, I guess I think that it's, it's important to say we actually don't know, we don't know that unilateral humanitarian intervention is is essential for uh, prevention of mass atrocity, and we at least should be worried that the use of war as a tool for mass atrocity prevention may exacerbate atrocity more than it improves it. Um, and so, um, anyway, I just want to move a little away from this kind of narrow debate over the legal issues and say, what you know, the goal is mass atrocity prevention. What do we know that really contributes? Take one more. Uh, I'm Lucas. I'm a visiting student from the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Um, my my question is whether it might be that the problem that you're talking about might lay more in the general acceptance of a legal basis for humanitarian interventions. That there's now a need to kind of solve this through the back door, or whether it's actually with the article. Eight uh, of the amended um, Rome Statute. Yeah. So uh, my two friends from Geneva have made a good point, which is there. There may be other ways to solve the problem. Prosecutorial guidelines might work. Do they bind subsequent prosecutors? The question is, do you want this decision to be made by the prosecutor? Shouldn't it be made by the Assembly of States parties? before the crime is formalized. What you're saying, which I completely agree, is if people believe that there's some core of humanitarian intervention that's lawful, we ought to agree on that before we do a bunch of things that might criminalize what we think is lawful. I am just suggesting that before we say this is a great accomplishment, we should use the time we have available to, one, admit there's an issue, and you don't hear that, and number two, try to address it. Now on uh, Catherine Sicking's fine point, is it a manifest violation of a charter to use force in every instance? If that's true, Catherine, then every permanent member of the UN can commit genocide against its own citizens and veto every resolution and then claim that they're acting lawfully, and nobody has a right to intervene. Now, do we have bad cases of humanitarian intervention? Yes. But we do have India, East Pakistan, uh, which led to the creation of Bangladesh. We have the action in Uganda. We have Kosovo. And then we have others that are, were in accordance with the UN Security Council action, like East Timor. And I think the real question is, some things, may not be most appropriately dealt with by international criminal process by a new court in which the prosecutor is making these decisions proprio motu. Now, if we see the issue, and I think there is an issue, the question is, is there a consensus on it? And Steve and I were in Kampala. Frankly, the interpretation that was offered uh, of Article 5.2 that led to this approach that we're at today was not something that I ever heard of 
until a week after Kampala was over. Now, we struggled to keep consensus because we thought that we were about 80, 90 percent of the way there, and we thought we had seven years to fix the problem. What we did not expect is that people will simply deny that there's an issue. You guys, I think, have it right. Let's start to figure out some kind of solution to resolve these two competing instincts, whether it's an interpretive declaration, partial opt-out, whether it is prosecutorial guidelines, whether it's clarification of the definition of humanitarian intervention. Creative lawyers ought to be able to come up with an answer. But simply saying, there's consensus and there's no issue is not enough. Because at the end of the day, responsible leaders are going to be asking their lawyers, what is our exposure? And those of you in the room who want to advise them have to be able to give them an answer other than, you have exposure, but you could opt out. OK. so. Um, they actually didn't say that. <laughs> I think you're putting words in their mouth, but that's, but that's fine. Uh, that's why it's so fun to, to, be, to debate with you. I thought these were good questions. Um, you know, the, uh, the prosecutor, of course, has the possibility of, of writing a policy paper, um, as she has done on, on other crimes. If she was to ask my opinion, I would tell her she should do that. Um, and I will I'll actually tell her to do that without being asked my opinion because it's, it's, it's obviously a very important thing and uh, it's something that states would certainly be very interested, uh, interested uh, in. I understood your colleague in the back to say, well, maybe there is just no agreement on humanitarian intervention. That's what I understood you to say. And of course, you're right. There isn't. Uh, and of course, this is why it was so difficult to reach the consensus on that particular language in Kampala. If you go to certain states and say, humanitarian intervention, then they say, oh, the, you know, this is a, this is a concoction, uh, concoction uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of Western countries. It's something that is not, not legal under any circumstance. Look at the chart of the United Nations. It says self-defense or it says authorization. Everything else is illegal. Now, that's not a view that I share. It's a view that is out there. It's a view that we had to take into account. It's as important as other views are especially because it's a view that is held by states that are parties to the Rome Statute, while others uh, are not, that have uh, strong views on that. So of course, you know, that, that is a very important point. And, and I, I'm, I'm grateful for what you said, uh, Catherine, um, because, you know, that's, you know, shouldn't leave the room here without quoting Ben Ferenc, uh, who was a prosecutor in Nuremberg and who has, you know, made the criminalization of the illegal use of force uh, his lifetime achievement, he has always said, and he knew because he was, you know, member of the armed forces uh, in Europe, he said there is no war without war crimes. The moment you have an armed conflict, you do have war crimes. There is no such thing as a clean war. And of course, you're right in saying that uh, this actually leads to war crimes and perhaps uh, to other things. But I think your, your main point that I very, very strongly concur with is that there, there are others, other means to prevent mass atrocities that are more effective and you know, can be done in a much more timely manner. And I think that's how we have failed in Syria, honestly. You know, it was a breakdown of diplomacy from day one almost. This is not a discussion about you know, who should intervene, how militarily now or in 2014, you know, the reality is we have not had effective diplomacy in Syria, dealing with the conflict in Syria for five and a half years. That is the reality. So uh, I worked very closely with the late Richard Holbrook, who forged the Dayton Accord out of comparable bloodshed to Syria. And one of the things he said is, diplomacy backed by force works better than just diplomacy. And you have no clearer example of that than Syria. That's exactly what John Kerry said a couple weeks ago. The reason that we have not had a serious diplomatic negotiation is that people are claiming that the threat of force is legally removed from the table. 
despite this ongoing debate about humanitarian intervention. Now, I agree, that's the big issue. And into this enters the crime of aggression, a noble exercise. And the question is, it will inevitably play into this discussion. Now, if, as Christian believes, there can be circumstances where you could have a lawful humanitarian intervention that's not a manifest violation of the charter and shouldn't be prosecuted, why not clarify what those circumstances might be before we activate the crime of aggression? If we could do that, you would have a lot more acceptances of the crime of aggression and it would be a much bigger success. That means you must acknowledge that there's an issue to be addressed. And what worries me about the conversation today is it confirms my view that those who have put a lot of energy in would just like to say, it's over. And my view is, it's not over till it's over. Ambassador, I'll give you the last word, and then we have to close. Thank you. Uh, well, we keep coming back to Syria as I think we should. Um, we have established beyond any reasonable doubt that if the ICC today had jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, nobody would be prosecuted for using force in Syria. And I think that is a very, um, that is a very important uh, point. Now, on, you know, I, I think the, the, the issue really is not that we don't have enough use of force in Syria. The issue is that we don't have enough diplomacy. So, I mean, we can, you know, talk uh, over lunch about how many states today are militarily involved in Syria directly or indirectly. But it doesn't matter. I think we will both conclude it's not a problem of not enough states using force in Syria. What we have is use of force backed by no diplomacy. And I think Richard Holbrook wouldn't have liked that. There's just one factual correction. <laughs> I, I, I had no, no, there's, there's a factual correction because I, I, you cannot leave people with this misimpression. <laughs> if a British plane takes off from the Netherlands and flies into Syria to set up a no fly zone, it is conceivable, since they have now ratified the crime of aggression, that there would be a basis for a claim of illegal use of force. Now, even in Syria, so that is the kind of thing that fits into the question of whether we have coalition building or not. So already it's starting to enter the calculus. We, we were advised, or I was advised, that back in 2013 when President Obama raised the issue of the red line, a number of the countries would not participate because of their lack of certainty about how the crime of aggression would affect them. Now, I'm saying that there's a problem, and it can be clarified. So let's clarify it together in a way that achieves the best outcome. But let's not pretend that there's no problem. So we have a definitional issue also with respect to last words. Yeah, I, I yeah, appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate that. No, no, you have the last word. Okay, now the last word, please. Syria is not a party to the Rome Statute. There is no jurisdiction over crimes committed in Syria if it is a crime that is a crime of aggression. That is very clear. Um, you know, I, I enjoy this conversation, as I always do. I thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, I really think that we have a very important body of law here that we have created. International criminal law moves, moves very slowly. This has taken 70 years. This is a big thing. It will take much longer to give this the reach that possibly it should and it will have and I hope you can all contribute to that. Thank you. So I have moderated a number, many discussions. This was easily the most engaging and the most spirited. Um, so please join me in thanking um, Ambassador Venables. Thank you.